Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here in the Sympathetic Seminar. And also thanks to the audience for coming here today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the Lagrangian capacity. Let's look at an outline for the talk. First, I'm going to state what my goal for this talk is. It's going to be to prove some conjecture, at least in some special cases. After that, we're going to have a basic section where I'm going to state the necessary definitions for us to understand the conjecture and also to motivate this conjecture. And finally, we're going to look at some results um, I was able to prove in the direction of um, proving this, uh, this conjecture. And if time allows, also some proof sketches. Okay, let's see what the conjecture is then. This conjecture states that if X is a convex or concave toric domain, then its Lagrangian capacity is equal to this delta, where delta is a number, I'm going to define it later, and I will usually call it the diagonal. And as I said, our goal today would be to motivate this conjecture to, to explain why should we believe this is true. Um, and after that, to prove it, at least in some special cases. OK, let's start with some basic definitions then. Uh, the first of those being the, the moment map. This is going to be the map mu from Cn onto this positive quadrant of Rn, which is given as follows. So I will take each zi, take its absolute value, square, and then multiply the resulting tuple by pi. With this, uh, a toric domain, this is a star-shaped domain x of the form x equals x omega, where omega is some subset of this positive quadrant of Rn. And x omega is the pre-image of omega under mu. OK, and in this context, I can define the diagonal of the toric domain, uh, which is denoted by delta. And this is going to be the biggest number a, such that the constant tuple with value a is inside omega. OK, let's look at some examples of toric domains, which are going to appear today. First, we have the cube, or polydisc. This is the set of z's in Cn, such that every zj is bounded. And the non-disjoint union of cylinders. This is the sets of z's in Cn, such that one of the zj is bounded. OK, now let's look at two symplectic capacities, uh, which have a simple definition and which are going to appear today. Uh, but before, I actually need to define what's the minimal symplectic area of a Lagrangian. So let's suppose that I have a symplectic manifold and that L is a Lagrangian submanifold. Then its minimal symplectic area of the Lagrangian is given as follows. First, I will consider disks with boundary on L. Um, and I will actually consider only those disks which have positive sim symplectic area. Okay, and then I take the smallest such symplectic area. Okay, th given this, I can define the Lagrangian capacity of the symplectic manifold X, and it's going to be given as follows. First, I will consider all embedded Lagrangian tori in X. Now, every such tori has a minimal symplectic area, and I take the biggest of those minimal symplectic areas. I will also need to use the cube capacity and the cube capacity of X, this is the biggest A, such that I can symplectically embed the cube with parameter A onto X. Okay, now let's look at two simple computational results concerning these capacities. Uh, the first states that if X is star-shaped, then its Lagrangian capacity is greater or equal than the cube capacity. And to prove this, uh, first, I will assume that I have a symplectic embedding of 
q with parameter a onto x. And I wish to show that the Lagrangian capacity of x is greater or equal to a. And for this, I will define this star as t, which is the pre-image under the moment map of this constant tuple with value a. And this is a torus which lives in the boundary of the cube. And I will, I, I will also map uh, t onto x under the embedding iota, and I will call that L. OK, and then to finish the proof, I will simply note that the Lagrangian capacity of x, by definition, this is greater or equal than the minimal symplectic area, which is equal to the minimal area of t, which is a by, by Stokes theorem. OK, let's look at the drawing, which illustrates what's happening here. Um, this drawing is done in the case where x is uh, toric. In that case, it has an omega set, which I drew here. Now, inside x, we have the cube, which has an omega set, which just shows up here as a square. Uh, the torus, its image under the moment map is just this point here. And finally, this green line. This is the image under the moment map of a disk, which realizes the minimal error. OK, next very simple lemma says that if x omega is convex or concave, then the cube capacity of x omega is greater or equal than delta. Uh, actually, this uh, it's known that this is an equality, but uh, for this talk, we'll only need this inequality, uh, the easy part. So, and the, the proof just goes as follows. So if x omega is convex or concave, then I know that the cube with parameter delta is contained inside x omega. We're going to look at the drawing, which explains this in a moment. But notice that this immediately implies the result just by definition of the cube capacity. OK, then let's look at the drawing I promised. Um, here, I have drawn omega in the case where x omega is convex. And let's consider what delta means. Delta means that I trace a diagonal, and eventually I reach the boundary of omega, and then I project down to the axis, and that's delta. And hopefully, you will agree that if I draw the cube here with a parameter delta, then that's going to be included inside omega since omega is convex. OK, I'm also stating here a similar result for the non-disjoint union of cylinders. That's actually not being used in this slide, but it's going to show up later in the talk. OK, now let's look at two results by Chile Black Monke concerning the Lagrangian capacity. First, they show that the Lagrangian capacity of the ball is 1 over n, which is equal to delta of the ball. And they also compute the Lagrangian capacity of the cylinder, which is 1, which is delta of the cylinder. OK, so now let's put everything together that we have seen and, and see what we, what we have learned. Uh, on one hand, we have seen that if x omega is convex or concave toric, then its Lagrangian capacity is greater or equal than the diagonal. But on the other hand, if x omega is either the ball or the cylinder, then we have equality. And this, uh, I think, motivates the conjecture I stated in the beginning of the talk, which is, do we have equality for every convex or concave toric domain. OK, now in the last section of the talk, I will explain the results I, I have proven concerning this uh, equality and also show some proof sketches. And these results will make use of uh, other symplectic capacities. And I don't really have time to define them, so I will we'll just state uh, which capacities it is that I'm using. First, I will be using the Makadov Siegel capacities. These are a family of capacities parameterized by two positive integers, k and l. 
I will also be using Siegel's higher symplectic capacities, which are similar to the Matthäus Siegel capacities, and the notation suggests that. And finally, I will be using the good Hutchings capacities, um, which are also parameterized by a positive integer k. Okay. And finally, let me point out that I will actually only use these capacities in the case L equals to one. Okay, so the first result that I have proven states that if X is the Liouville domain, then its Lagrangian capacity is less or equal than the good Hutchings capacity, sorry, the Macduff Siegel capacities divided by K. Okay, now let me show you an extremely condensed proof sketch of, of this statement. Uh, and it goes as follows. So first I will use the definition of the Lagrangian capacity. Uh, and I will conclude that I need to assume that I have some embedded Lagrangian torus in X. And our goal then is to prove that there exists some disk with boundary on L whose symplectic area is small. Now we need to use the definition of the Macduff Siegel capacities. And we conclude that there exists some sequence, which here I'm calling UT, of asymptotically cylindrical holomorphic curves. Uh, and the sequence has a uniform bound on its energy. And also every curve in this sequence satisfies the tangency constraint. Okay, now we need to use the SFT compactness theorem and take the limit of this sequence. And we will get the resulting broken holomorphic curve. And finally, um, let me just point out that one of the components in this broken holomorphic curve will be the small disk that we desire, the, the disk with small sympathetic character. Okay, now let's see at how could we use this, uh, this theorem in conjunction with theorems by other authors to prove the conjecture I stated in dimension four. So here it is, that result. This is just the, the statement of the conjecture when the toric domain is convex and four-dimensional. So let's look at the proof. First, uh, we know that the diagonal is less or equal than the, the cube capacity, which is less or equal than the Lagrangian capacity. And by the previous theorem, this is less or equal to the Macduff Siegel capacities. Now, since X omega is four dimensional and convex, I can use a result by Macduff Siegel uh, where they say that their capacities are equal to the good Hutchings capacity. Now, since X omega is convex, I can um, I know that X omega is a subset of this non-disjoint union of cylinders. We have seen this statement before in, in the talk. And I will use monotonicity of, of the sympathetic capacity to compare the capacity of X omega with the capacity of N delta. And finally, I will use a result by Gut and Hutchings where they compute the value of their capacity on the non-disjoint union of cylinders. And the result follows because this computation holds for every k. Okay, the next result I have, um, I, the next two results I have actually, um, they are, they they have the goal of proving this conjecture in dimensions or other than four. And for this, I will make use of Siegel's higher symplectic capacities. Um, and the definition of those relies on linearized contact homology. So from now on in the talk, I will always be assuming that linearized contact homology is something that exists and that we can use. Um, in this case, uh, I have shown that uh, for any Liouville domain satisfying some topological assumptions, 
that uh, the higher sympathetic capacities are equal to the root Hutchings capacities. And let's again look at a very condensed proof sketch of this statement. First, I will consider a skinny ellipsoid, which embeds into X sympathetically. Next, we use the definition of the two capacities in the statement, as well as the bourgeois Oanshia isomorphism between linearized contact homology and S1 equivariant sympathetic homology. And we would conclude that to prove this statement, we actually only need to show that this virtual count is non-zero. So now let me explain what is the moduli space which shows up in, in this virtual count. This is the moduli space of asymptotically cylindrical holomorphic planes uh, in the completion of the ellipsoid, which satisfy a tangency constraint. OK, so now to prove that this virtual count is non-zero, the first thing we need to do is we would show that the relevant moduli space is transversely cut out. And then by assumption on the virtual perturbation scheme, which I'm, I'm assuming that such a thing should exist, um, we would conclude that the virtual count of this moduli space is equal to the count in the usual sense. And finally, we would compute the count the, the, the count in the usual sense explicitly. And we are able to do that because curves uh, in this moduli space are actually polynomials. They have somewhat of an explicit form. OK, then finally, let's look at the, the last result I, I have to show, which is that um, the conjecture holds provided that some suitable virtual perturbation scheme exists such that I can define linearized contact homology and the higher sympathetic capacities. Um, in this case, we can prove the statement as follows. So I will start out the proof just as before. So I'll, I will compare the diagonal with the cube capacity, then with the Lagrangian capacity, then with the McLeod Siegel capacities. After I use a result by uh, McDuff Siegel, they explain that the McDuff Siegel capacities are less or equal to the higher sympathetic capacities. Now I use the previous theorem um, and, and argue that the higher sympathetic capacities are equal to the Good Hutchings capacities. And the last two steps of the proof, again, are equal to the proof I showed previously. So I will compare first x with the non-disjoint union of cylinders. And I finally use the formula by good Hutchings. OK, this finishes the proof of this theorem and also finishes my talk. So thank you all for listening. And I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, can you remind what's the difference between the McDuff Siegel capacities and the higher symplectic capacities of Siegel? Yeah. So the higher symplectic capacities are defined in terms of linearized contact homology. These are sort of the biggest number. A, such that an augmentation map, which counts curves satisfying a tangency constraint, restricted to action level A is non-zero, something along those lines. And the McDuff siegel capacities are sort of a restatement of this, which does not require the existence of linearized contact homology. So you would directly define them as sort of, a, I think it's, the supremum over almost complex structures of uh, an infimum of action values such that some moduli space of curves is non-empty. So it, it, they are defined directly in terms of the moduli space, 
and that moduli space can be just a set doesn't need to be a manifold for this definition to work and do they like are they known to be different or um i don't think they are known to be different the 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 inequality i mentioned is known and as far as I know, there are no examples where they are different. Okay, thanks. More questions? And what will happen if in definition of Lagrangian capacity, one will use other manifolds, not just Tori? So, so, so why Tori, can you explain? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a very good answer to this question, unfortunately. Uh, I think it would be different, but um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I know this. <laughs> Another another interesting question is um, looking at more than one torus. So there were questions of um, could you how many like if you if you fix the minimal symplectic area for Lagrangian torus, how many disjoint such Lagrangian tori can you put into your tor So there's some papers by uh, Richard Richard and behind about that. Um, can, can your method say anything about that sort of question? I don't think so, no. Um, I think that the key, so if I go back to the results, I mean, there are roughly two things I can say about the Lagrangian capacity. I can find a lower bound, which is relatively simple, which I'll, we saw the proof of those lemmas. And then I find an upper bound in terms of some holomorphic curves and then I'm in, in the domain sort of in the domain of holomorphic curves and I use capacities which are defined in terms of homologies. Um, so essentially I, I what I'm saying about the Lagrangian capacity is concentrated in this inequality here. And I think that the methods I used are very specific. They really only show that the disk with small symplectic area exists. Uh, I don't think that these methods directly would give you more information about Lagrangians, uh, as far as I know. Okay. Uh, maybe this is a more general question, but this 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 information you derived for alluvial domains does that allows you to produce i mean is this related to some geometric information you could say something you could say about symplectic homology cohomology sorry or is it sort of a completely separate story Mm. It, per, perhaps this is possible, but I don't really know how. I mean, for me, the, these computations, they seem to go a bit the other way around. I, I, it looks to me that I'm using the homologies to derive information about the, the capacities. Um, I see, and you do not expect some mutual exchange of information there. I, I would be more inclined to say no than yes, um, but per perhaps this is possible. Okay, thank you. More questions? And maybe let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>